Well, good morning, everyone. I think I know many of you, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rachel Durkin and my company is Paradigm Marketing and Design. I'm going to just run through very quickly what we do and who we are. Um, we are an award-winning marketing, web, and branding agency. Uh, we work with our clients to support them in their um, you know, branding strategy, web development needs, digital marketing. But more importantly, we serve most of the time as our clients outsource marketing department. So developing strategies, creating tactics, creating metrics, and what I call KPIs or key performance indicators, and helping them to achieve their goals. The, we are insanely busy right now <laughs> because everything we've ever done well uh, or, or the, the way we've done things has been thrown out the window and we are pivoting very quickly. And I'm going to talk about that for a lot of our clients because um, I don't want to say, I don't want to use the, opportun the word opportunity in this terrible, terrible time, but for quite a few, there is an opportunity because the consumer mindset and the customer you know, DNA and how they think has pivoted vastly. And in certain industries, the decision-making processes for things and the need for things is skyrocketing. So I'm gonna talk more about that, but um, that's kind of what we're gonna jump into today. So uh, if you look back at the last recession, 170,000 small businesses uh, closed their doors. But at the same time, the US, uh, the small business economy accounts for 53% of the US workforce, which is why the government is spending so much time trying to keep everybody employed right now. Uh, or in giving small businesses support. The, my point here is, is that crisis fuels innovation. It, it's, it's, in every study you're ever gonna look at, you're gonna see a crazy amount of innovation and, and new changes that come out of any crisis. And so when all of those small businesses closed in 2008 to 2010, a lot of people got laid off. We had what, about 10% unemployment at that time. And it was kind of the, you know, you, you can argue that the gig economy existed, but it really boomed right around 2010. A lot of people started new businesses. There were solopreneurs, there was gig workers, contractors, and that lasted for a long time. And these huge companies, names you know now, like Airbnb and Uber built, and you can argue Amazon even really took off from here, um, built, these entire infrastructures around this gig economy. They basically sourced different gig workers to be their workers on um, demanded services and products. And so my point here is that we have to understand that what is happening is changing our entire fundamental beliefs and structures. And so this concept of, and I'm gonna talk more about this, of it's gonna end in a week, it's gonna end in a month, it'll be better by June, is, is short-sighted because the changes we're seeing now, the forced innovation that's happening, a lot of it is going to stay and it's gonna change the way we think and the way we work. And so, um, and I'll talk more about that in just a second. There's three things, and I'm, I'm really generalizing this, but there's three things that's gonna decide if a company lives or dies <clears throat> during a crisis like this, or, or just in general. One is economic factors, so, or environmental factors. So, you know, you can't control the COVID or the, pan the global pandemic. That's certainly making some businesses turn upside down. The other is gonna be cash reserved. How strong, how, what type of position are they in to support a downturn and for how long? So how long do they have to pivot and innovate? And then the third is gonna be innovation, the application of the innovation strategies and the evolution that they move through. This is the only thing besides the cash reserves is something that hopefully they've done, you know, leading up to this. The innovation and application and evolution is the only thing you can control as a business owner or as a business leader right now. And so we really need to take a look at what is the current environment and how can we pivot? And I'll talk more about that in just a second. If you've ever read the book Good to Great by Jim Collins, he talks about the stocks fail paradox. And it's funny because I, like I'm sure many of you, as going through this crisis, one day I think one way, oh, you know, it'll be over, to, you know, in a couple weeks. The next day I'm like, oh my gosh, the world is ending. We're going to, it's like the walking dead. We've got to prepare. Uh, sometimes I think I'm going to, should I just shut the business down and kind of go into my turtle shell for 30 days? And then the next thing I think is, no, we have to keep going because we have to innovate. And so it's easy to kind of get into your own head. But when I read this, when I was reminded of this book and this story, it really made me think differently a couple weeks ago. So I'm going to be reading a little bit from this. But essentially, um, Stocksdale was a 
Vietnam, sorry, I have somebody walking into my office. Stockstill was a uh, Vietnam veteran and he was a pilot during the Vietnam War. And he crashed his plane in 1965 and what became a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And during that time, he was a POW for seven and a half years. When they captured him, they broke his leg and his leg had never healed properly and it was broken two more times during his captivity. He received no medical attention. He was beaten and starved regularly and he was with several other prisoners of war. And he became a leader to them. And not only did he lead them, but he also supported, or he actually led them through an uprising against their captors at a certain time and helped to, to keep many of the men alive during that terrible, terrible seven and a half years that they had to deal with. And when asked, he was being interviewed by Jim Collins, and they asked him uh, how he got through it. And what he said was, uh, and I want to read this exactly right, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. So I don't think there's a better explanation of leadership during a terrible time. And then Jim Collins asked him, well, who was it that, that survived this? Obviously the cynics and the skeptics aren't gonna win in life. And we always assume that the optimists rule the world, that they believe they can do and they do. And so Jim Collins asked him about the prisoners who didn't make it through that time. And he said, that's easy, the optimists didn't make it. Oh, they were the ones who said, we're going to be out by Christmas and Christmas would come and Christmas would go. And then they'd say, we're going to be out by Easter and Easter would come and Easter would go. And then they'd say the same thing for Thanksgiving and then Christmas again. And eventually they died of a broken heart. So there's this paradox that it's not the cynics who make it out and it's not the pure optimists who make it out. It's a combination of, the, of both of them. And so as you're going through this leading your business, running your business, I think we have to accept the fact, just like I said before, is nothing will ever be the same. This is our new normal until it's not. And so as we market through this, or as we grow our businesses through this, we kind of have to accept our new reality. There's a downturn, we've all lost revenue. Um, but where do we go from here is the question. And so um, uh, there was a study done by McGraw Research that uh, said that they, they looked at 600 companies during the 2008 recession. And they found that the companies who marketed aggressively through the recession on average grew 275% over the next five years. And the companies that kind of went into their turtle shell and hid and cut costs and didn't market only grew 19%. And what that tells you is that if, as we're looking forward, we're all worried about right now. We're worried about the clients we're losing right now. We're worried about tomorrow and the next day. But what about the quarter, next quarter, and the quarter after that, and the quarter after that? When we're looking at this environment, we need to understand what we can handle now and what we can accomplish now. Are you going to close sales or is nothing going to happen until May or June or whenever it might be? But we have to prepare for that growth when the time comes. So everyone's talking about it's like a, going to be, you know, it's a V-shaped economy. So we've plummeted very, very quickly, faster than we ever have before. And there's a lot of projections that we're going to grow just as quickly when, you know, it's going to be a rocket taking off or maybe it's gonna be a U, so we're gonna flatten out, but then we're gonna grow again. You have a choice. You can either be on the front of that rocket when the, ro when the economy starts to take back off, or you can be hiding in your turtle shell and coming out at the end of the, uh, at the very lag of it. And that's how you're not, that's gonna cause you to not grow as much as you can. So I'm gonna give you some examples of how we can leverage this. But before I say that, I want to point out um, an analogy I've been using. It's Essentially, we've been playing checkers for a long time and we all got really, really good at checkers. And this happened and the checkerboard is gone and now we're playing chess. And so if you're still trying to play checkers, you are not gonna make it. If you, the, the goal here is to learn how to play chess and learn how to play it as fast as you can because that is the new game and it's not going to go back. So, um, and then as I talk about leader decisions in this, and I'm going to give you some case studies that I'm seeing from clients that we're working with, you know, and I mentioned the optimist and the pessimist and the Stocksville paradox, it's got to be a combination of both. But what I'm seeing with a couple clients is I've had clients who <laughs> literally within a week just shut down, went into their like hidey hole and are like, I'm going to call me when this is out. I can't, I can't function or do anything. Uh, I've had other clients that have literally hired us because of this crisis or doubled down on their marketing. And I said, this is the opportunity. This is where we're going to grow. 
um, I have to believe in, in there's some days that I'm, you know, I'm struggling too, but I have to believe that the optimists to a point that are, are accepting their current situation and are going to market through it are the ones that are going to come out of this. So uh, there's two things that I'm seeing when we're, when we're embracing the innovation here. One is new audiences and one is new opportunities. One is around marketing and one is around operation shifts and then marketing those operational changes. So as I'm talking about this, I just want you to think about that because what's happening is some companies are literally dying. There's industries that if, if you were, if the airline was your client, if a hotel chain was your client, if a travel agency was your client, that there's no, that is gone right now. It might come back, but for now it's gone. However, there is a huge amount of new businesses being born. Employment attorneys are busier than they've ever been. I have controller clients and CFOs are busier than they've ever been. Uh, technology clients, and I'm gonna share a case study with you, are busier than they've ever been. There's a whole new set of companies that are being born right now that we don't even know about that are gonna be growing at a rapid pace. So the reason I'm telling you that is we need to, we are in the middle of a new life cycle. And so while some companies are dying, others are being born and others are growing at an exponential rate. And so if you feel your business is devastated because the clients you were serving are gone, understand that it's about pivoting either your service or your deliverable or your new client because there is new opportunity being born. Okay, so I'm gonna give you guys a couple case studies so you can kind of understand where I'm going with this. So one of, uh, I'm just checking the time. So we have a client that is a dress shop and during the earlier stages when they closed all non-essential businesses, there's still people getting married. Now I understand some weddings are canceled, but you have to order a wedding dress at least about a year in advance for several months in advance in order to get it. So people are still shopping and they couldn't have anybody come into the store. So they started doing virtual uh, shopping and then they would ship you five or six dresses or drop them off at your house and you could try them on and then you would give them back when you chose the dress and they would do it again and again. Now, it's interesting because not only did they innovate uh, to stay in business during this time, but it's actually going to turn out to not be a temporary thing because they're finding that one, they're getting a new revenue stream from the virtual shopping. Two, they're differentiating themselves pretty significantly from the competition because nobody's doing that yet. And three, they're increasing the likelihood of their conversion rate because they used to have people who came in and browse, but now if you're giving a $100 deposit that comes off when you buy the dress, they're more likely to retain those customers. So it's actually helping their business model because they don't have to pay workers to just sit in the store all day for people who might wanna come in and browse. They're paying people when they're needed and they're getting a deposit for their time. So it's, it's interesting because this innovative model, while putting them in a good marketing position, is actually going to help their bottom line in the long term. Um, <clears throat> another client we work with is an HVAC company. These guys serve uh, commercial, so hotels, which isn't great right now, but also hospitals, uh, office buildings. They senior centers, they serve large commercial buildings for HVAC needs and also all different other types of equipment. So kitchen equipment uh, and appliances. They have always had a problem, many people in this industry do, in with a labor shortage. Right now there's a huge labor shortage in technicians in this industry. And so recruiting was always their number one uh, strategy and issue. When this happened, a lot of people didn't want to have strangers coming in to uh, do maintenance on their equipment. And because of the labor shortage, they have this tool that allows a junior technician to go in, do a diagnostic, and then it's almost like FaceTime, but also has diagnostic capabilities, speak with a senior technician who's remote, and they can collaborate on how to fix an issue. So what the company started doing was sending out to all of their clients and the facility managers this tool and the senior, uh, the senior uh, technicians were able to do virtual consults over, over the phone and they were able to fix it. Now, it's interesting because one, this kept them in business, this is keeping them in business right now, but two, what's fascinating is this might even solve their labor problem going forward because now they can get more done with less labor needed and, and serve more clients because they can do more virtually. So again, changing their whole business model for the long term and also positioning them, giving them a differentiating factor to go to market with. Okay. 
Uh, another client we work with is a techni tech, uh, they do virtual meetings, among other things. They, they really serve all software and hardware for companies, but the big thing is virtual meetings. Now, these guys are, they're, they're almost like the David to Zoom's Goliath. They're always, they're trying, they're much smaller, they, but they're always competing with Zoom and WebEx company, those two companies. During this time, and they happen to be in a good financial place because they sold off part of their business a couple months ago and they got, they, so they have a, quite a bit of cash. They called me, the, the president's brilliant. He called me up the day this all happened and he said, I need you to get organized. We're doing a campaign. I'm giving away to anybody who wants it three months of free virtual meeting services or until the COVID crisis is over. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you're going to get, like basically for three months, you're not going to get paid. You're just going to work like crazy and you're going to sign up all these people. Now, at this moment, or a couple weeks ago, and it's probably still happening, there's a huge a forced adaption to technology. So my company happens to have always been remote, so we were pretty comfortable with it. But there, I can't tell you how many clients I had who were just freaking out about having to set up virtually. I mean, we, you know, we work with like clients that sell, or not sell anymore, like, you know, BMS or Bristol Myers. And the technology department is so stretched because they're trying to get everybody remote. Uh, Zoom is enabled to hold up to it. They already, Zoom already announced that they can only guarantee the quality of a meeting for up to three people. WebEx is, is taxed. And so it's, it's interesting because during this adaption to technology, you're going to pick the one, whatever one you pick, WebEx, Zoom, these guys, it's going to become the technology you're used to. And it's going to probably be the one that you stick with because people are adverse to friction and switching technologies once they become accustomed to something or form a habit. So essentially this company decided we're going to give away our services. And then as soon as that's over, we're going to start charging the monthly fee that we would normally charge. Their goal here is to steal market share from Zoom and WebEx. It always has been. And this move is going to put them in that place. It's going to create a, a ton of loyal customers. We're getting them with the library systems. We're, we're getting them in with government agencies. We're getting them in with nonprofits. And we're getting them in with small businesses. And it's, it was really a brilliant move. I wish I had thought of it. It was a brilliant move on his part. But uh, there is an opportunity there in the market. And he's leveraging it for three months out from now, not for today. OK, let me switch. I'm jumping around and I'm away from my notes. OK. So let's talk about for a second uh, co-marketing and collaboration. Initially when this happened, my team felt, well, we guessed wrong, but we felt strongly that the cost, all advertising was going to move to digital and that the cost of social media ads was about to skyrocket and it was going to become a very crowded marketplace. Actually, the opposite happened. Uh, Facebook announced that its ad sales are down, which I'm surprised by. I guess people are cutting back on marketing. But what we're finding is most people don't necessarily want to spend the money on advertising. And if you were, if you were marketing effectively up until now, you're in a better place because you've got an email list, you've got a social media following, you've got the web hits. If you weren't and your tradition, your strategy was traditional marketing, you're in a little bit of trouble. And so, because you have to build up. And so before I kind of get into the concept of this co-marketing, I do want to explain uh, what I mean by brand building and building marketing assets, because I'm going to use that term. So when you're building marketing assets, think of it as if you are in an auditorium, you own an auditorium with 100,000 or a million seats, and you're allowed to stand on the stage of that auditorium whenever you want and scream whatever you want, and whoever's on the, in the auditorium is going to listen to you. If nobody is in that auditorium, you look like a crazy person. If that auditorium is full to the top, you are in really good shape because everybody in that room is going to listen and you don't have to spend a dime to get them to listen to you. That is the concept of building your email list, building your social media following, building your notoriety and your brand awareness. It means that you've already been giving out valuable content and people are already listening. So a lot of our clients who had been building their marketing strategy are in pretty good shape. They might have an email list of 10,000 or 5,000 or whatever in a, a social media following of several thousand. And that means that when they're ready to offer their service or in this time of crisis, have a, you know, quickly get the word out about something, people are going to be listening to them because they've got access to this data. If you haven't built it up yet, or even if you have, the concept of cross marketing is very powerful. So one of the very first thing I did, and we have a list of about, I think like 10,000 people. One of the very first things I did 
was reach out to other thought leaders who served my target audience. So HR, uh, employment attorneys, HR consultants, uh, CFOs, anybody who also serves the small business market and the same, who wants access to the same decision makers I do. And I created an alliance with them. We actually have, this is like a shameless plug, but we have an event coming up on April 23rd that we're just about to start marketing. We're going to do a full day virtual summit where we're going to have different experts in half hour slots giving out free information about any, everything from HR and employment to, to personal, to uh, digital marketing, to virtual sales, all of it. The point is, is that we've quickly created a website that's going to launch at the end of the week. And we're putting all of our thought leadership around COVID on this website. Every webinar, every written article, every video tip, everything. And the goal is, is to drive more traffic to that website so that people will download different resources, so that they'll engage with us, so that they're going to come to our different events. The reason we we're doing that as a coalition is because I have an email list of 10,000, but all my other nine partners also have an email list of five or 10,000. So instead of me emailing 10,000 people about my webinar and my research and my information that I want to share, I now have access to 100,000 because we have agreed to cross market together. So this concept of creating a coalition, an alliance, something that can provide value to multiple target audiences, if done and planned appropriately, can exponentially improve your message to your audience and allow you to capture new audiences that didn't know you before. The goal is also, of course, I'm gonna work with people like, uh, a lot of you know Donna Miller who has the same list, similar list as me, but I'm also working with other partners who have a very different list from me and that's the goal so that we can cross promote for each other. And then another concept is this goal of facilitating being the first to market in with new innovation. So one of the challenges that we had right away is, is part of our strategy is to market to in traditional ways. We would go, we, we relied heavily on the chamber. We'd go to events. We would go to business connections and women in business and we'd be shaking hands. And my, that's how my sales team met people and we brought in most of our leads. The digital strategy certainly supported those efforts, but a, but a huge, I would say like 70% of our, of our inbound leads came from traditional networking and marketing strategies. So when we, when this kind of hit us that we couldn't go anywhere, we were, we were all at a standstill and there wasn't a lot of groups, but I'm sure you're seeing things popping up with digital networking, digital groups, digital happy hours, which is great. One of the first things we did was start a lunch for four concept. So every Monday and Wednesday, we are facilitating, it's, being, it's become quite a bit of work, but it's worth it, uh, a lunch for four. So you can register on our website for the lunch, and then we will put you in groups of four, and you'll have intimate Zoom meetings with four different people on Mondays and Wednesdays, and you get to meet new people at every single lunch. It's laid back, it's an opportunity to network, it's an opportunity to, to grow your business virtually. There's two things here that I think are, are that I wanna point out that, I think are gonna make, that are making this very successful. One, the consistency. It's like a snowball effect. If you just have a random uh, virtual networking group or a random event, it doesn't get the same traction as if you have something continuous. So the fact that, we're, I think we're in our second week of this and we've got like 70 people registered for each one. It's, and, and we've done very little marketing for it, but it's great and we really wanna grow it. The second thing is, because we were one of the first to do it, we're seen as, as, a, as a confidant, as a thought leader, as a resource for people to go to. So it might not have anything to do with marketing and we're not using it as a sales strategy, but we're using it as a way to build collaboration with other businesses that, that wanna collaborate. The other thing that I'm getting out of the deal and I'm putting a lot of ad, administrative hours into it is email lists. We're getting access to businesses and additional, their email addresses that we would have never had before because we're getting 70 to 80 new people every single time they're coming. So it's, I would have never thought of this. I actually, I had thought of it before, but it's quite a bit of work. So I've always been hesitant to start our own networking groups, especially when the chamber has them and there's other opportunities, but it's putting us in a leadership role and giving us access to data that we didn't have before. So something I want you to think about in addition to the co-marketing is what can you do to be seen as a leader and a confidant in this time? Okay, so 
let me just pivot for a second and I'm going to do a time check. Okay, I'm getting close. So the other thing that we, I want to point out is, is the concept of being the first to market here. Uh, a lot's happened in this time, but there's a lot more is going to happen. And normally, my normal MO, my normal motiva like strategy, and my team is kind of a little shocked, <laughs> that, but they'll, they'll recover, is to be methodical, to be purposeful, to be strategic. So I don't like to do anything. I don't like to do any sort of campaign unless we've got six weeks to plan or eight weeks to plan. Every, every marketing initiative should address another marketing initiative or, and multiple goals, and it should all tie together. And so when we're doing plans, we're thinking three months ahead. We're thinking a year ahead. We're integrating and intertwining campaigns for continuous growth. All of that is out the window right now, which is why we've basically had to throw out every marketing plan and we've done for every client at the beginning of the year and redo them. And the reason being is that the environment is changing at such a rapid pace. The new laws are coming out. The new laws are pivoting. There's new challenges happening. There's new opportunities that are, that are coming that we can only think a couple weeks ahead. I mean, a month, doing a marketing plan a month out would be ambitious. So we're pivoting at campaigns at a very, very quick level. And my new, my new uh, saying is it, does, it just has to be done. It doesn't have to be perfect, which is the exact opposite of any words you would ever hear coming out of my mouth in marketing you know, a month ago. But you have to get to market quickly. You have to be one of the earlier ones that are showing thought leadership and support. And you want to, because, because if you notice like the Payroll Protection Act, that's coming out. They just announced that that's going to be released. The applications are released on April 3rd. People have been talking about that for weeks now. The first ones to talk about it are the people who probably have the most clients that they're supporting in it right now. So right now the, the, the game has changed. Slow and steady is not necessarily winning the race. We need to be fast and reactive during this time. And so you wanna make sure you have a team that is with you and ready to do that as quickly as possible. So uh, we're, we're, we're about 30 minutes in, so I'm just gonna recap quickly and I'll answer some questions. But essentially we wanna, just to recap, we wanna to continue to cultivate your network. So whether that's virtually or in cross marketing strategies, we wanna make sure that we're using others and other resources and then offering our resources so that we can all grow together. So looking at people who have the same target audience as you and creating coalitions or alliances, they do have to be planned, they do have to be purposeful, and they do have to be executed together in a team effort to be successful, but it can really exponentially improve your reach to your audience. The second is conducting strategy sessions with business leaders. Nobody can do this in a silo. I have had to bring in operations experts, HR attorneys, CFOs, outsource controllers to collaborate with because there's too many moving parts. So the other asset to that coalition I made is that everybody has a different area of expertise and we're able to lean on each other and ask questions. The, when you try to do your own marketing in time of crisis like this, and I even brought in other marketing experts to collaborate with and to bounce ideas off of, it you almost can't see the forest through the trees. You're kind of in this like paralyzed moment. So definitely, you know, if you have a coach, if you have a friend, if you can, if you do masterminds with people, have a, have an agenda and a, and a target, a targeted goal for the meeting, but discuss what can we be doing? How can we be pivoting? What needs to be offered? I mean, if you look at, this is obvious, but if you look at car companies that are now creating ventilators, or you look at breweries that are now creating hand sanitizer. I mean, they shifted their entire operation model and they're getting a lot of revenue from it. So bring in other experts and then really consider balancing short-term necessities with long-term growth potential. If you have the, the business means to do it, remind yourself that marketing through this, if you have the, if you have the assets to market through this, you're going to want to double down and you're going to want to do it as smartly as you can. Because again, we're not necessarily, I mean, you can, can we get some quick leads in, in the short term, depending on your industry? Yes. But what we need to be marketing for now is next month and the month after that and the next quarter. Because if you hide in your shell, you're going to lose all the opportunity when the market takes off. If you focus then, and you can hold on for a couple of weeks or a month or whatever it might be, and there's a lot of loans out there and grants that are gonna help you do that, and you market through this, when the rocket takes back off, you will be at the front of it. So I am offering strategy sessions for free for anybody who wants to do it with me. 
Uh, so if you want to email my team member, Crystal, she will schedule time with you on my calendar and we can talk about your business and how you can leverage uh, whatever opportunities are in the market for you right now to, to benefit and innovate over time. The other thing that I want to mention is we do have a ton of resources on our website. So if you go to paradigm.md.com, uh, these are a couple, I'm going to send these slides out, but there's a couple right here, but there's additional ones that you can download that will help you in this time. And I will also be sending out as soon as the site launches, the website we made for the Alliance, that's going to have all the information from different resource, from different experts on how to be reacting to this COVID crisis. And that's all I got. Okay, Rachel, thank you so much for taking the time to do this presentation for us. I definitely learned a lot and I appreciate it. Um, I just want to give a heads up. I'm putting something in chat for everyone regarding social media. We will be posting a recording of this on our YouTube channel once it is edited. Um, you can also check on our Facebook and LinkedIn pages for future, future um, webinars. Tomorrow's is how to lead through a crisis. So I'm posting that now. And if you have questions for Rachel, please put them in the chat. Okay. I have some private messages, but I don't think anything is on <laughs> to those later. Okay, good. Do you want me to stay on to answer questions or? Uh, it's up to you. Anyone? I can, I wouldn't recommend unmuting all just because there can be a lot of background noise, but what I can do is I can make it so people can unmute themselves for comments. If you would like, it would just take a quick moment. See. One moment. And I'll get rid of the background noise so people can unmute themselves. Okay, so if anyone has a comment. Juan, what, what were your first? There we go. What were your first steps in starting online marketing? Um, so I'm sorry, online networking. Um, I'm trying to think back now. <laughs> Having the idea. So um, this comes down to the moving fast and not being too methodical about it. I usually tend to outthink, overthink every single thing and how it applies to the long-term strategy. And we essentially decided just to do it. And we just started with a feeler. Hey, does anybody want to come to a, a lunch Zoom meeting with us? And we started with very low tech, sending out an email and people responded. And we set up, we asked different people to be hosts and we just collaborated on the hosting event. The, the key there was though setting up the consistency. We decided early on that it was going to be two days a week, every week until this is over. So um, what I would do is consider, I don't know that one-offs are gonna be as impactful for you. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying don't do them, but if you're gonna do something, try to do it with consistency. The other the co-marketing strategy because if there's we're, what we're doing right now is we're turning that lunch for four concept i mean we've we've teamed up with the newark business business regional partnership we've turned we've teamed up with a couple other companies and now they're sending people so but at this point now that we're all starting to grow out of this look at collaboration opportunity to make your life easier you don't necessarily have to start independently you can you can partner up with somebody and there's always strength in numbers What is the criteria for being part of the virtual networking before? Nothing. All you have to do is register. <laughs> if you go to our website, uh, it should, I don't know if it's on the website yet, but if you uh, send me your email, I will be sure to send it out to you, the information, if you want to put it in the chat. Um, there's a lot of comments here. Some of it is people. Okay, I think, I think that's all the questions. Rachel? Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, do you have a moderator in each of those groups? The, the group, the lunch for four is one of your people in each of those rooms. And also what is your call to action? What, what is your, how do you determine, excuse me, if these are successful, how do you capture the information? What are you hoping to get from it? And then how do you follow up from these leads that you're generating? Okay, I'm trying to answer. <laughs> a lot of stuff there. Yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not having a moderator for my company and everyone. It's impossible because we have too many people now. Um, we are offering. We were asking people to be a host. So if you have your own, we started using the Zoom breakout rooms, but Zoom is can't handle it apparently, and there was a lot of freezing. So we're going back to asking people to 
to host like as with their zoom link. And so essentially what happens is, is you, you are signing up to be in it by Thursday. And then by Friday, you're getting an email from my team saying, here's your group of four and your host is this person. And that host is then responsible for sending the link out and we're coordinating with the different hosts. What, my, you know, initially my, my initial marketing goal was to use the Zoom breakout rooms because what happens is, is you can start the meeting like this with everybody on it and then you click a button and it puts people into a breakout room. The reason I like that is it gave my team, you know, my, my account direct, uh, my, my director of client engagement or myself the opportunity to kind of do a plug or say something or share a resource for engagement. Uh, but then it wasn't working from a technology standpoint. So now they go right into the room and we don't have an opportunity to talk to everybody. That's okay though, because one, and I'll tell you a secret, uh, we have the ability to figure out who is it, who's, who sits with who. Now, of course we get requests and we're happy to accommodate them, but I can make sure that my team, is my sales team is strategically sitting at tables with people who would be a good target audience for us. The second thing is, we are capturing all the emails. So in marketing, and I didn't really talk about this in this, this presentation, but if you've heard me talk before, I basically talk about it every single time. It takes on average nine to 13 touches to engage your audience. And so it touches an email, a social media post, shaking someone's hand, going to their website. That the touch process must be facilitated over a period of time. It doesn't happen in a day. And so in order, and, and at the end of that process, if done right, that's when you're gonna get a sale or build brand trust. And so my goal here is to build that marketing assets and, and to build that auditorium, fill that auditorium that I talked about earlier. So by our company being charged of this networking opportunity, we're gaining emails. And of course we're respectful of them. We're not spamming anybody, but we get to continue to send out thought leadership. We get, I'm, gonna sure, I'm certainly gonna be sending this webinar as a download tool to my whole list. And part of that list is people who are attending lunch for four. So it's giving me the opportunity to build assets to re-engage and that's helping me in two ways. One, maybe it will help me now, not likely, you know, with new clients, except I have some that have urgent needs. And then, but it's definitely going to help me, I, I feel, in June, July, when the market turns around, we now have an exponentially larger list and we were seen as a thought leader during this time. So I'm giving away all my secrets. You have to keep thinking of me as a thought leader, but basically that's the goal. So it's not, you can't think of it as an, some things you can think of as immediate gratification and some things you have to think as building blocks for future growth. Are you able to segment in any way as you're going out there, you know, or is it more of a general thought leader message and you really can't segment? We can segment. It depends on our approach and the bandwidth, frankly. One of the next things we wanted to do was a mastermind group for different, uh, we're going to roll out mastermind groups. So it's smaller groups like of nine and we're going to, that will be facilitated and that will be segmented. But um, we're only a team of 10, so we can only manage so much at once and we're only two weeks in. So we actually had the mastermind groups about to go, the table for four and a happy hour. And I, I pulled it, I, I cut it off. I told the team like, let's, let's, Let's get this one working and then we'll roll out the next. So I'm going back against my whole being the first to market concept there, but you know, we have to do some things right. <laughs> we can't kind of be everything to all people yet. Thank you. Uh, Rachel, um, one of the things I've noticed is that with so many of these different networking events going on, it seems that a lot of them though are falling at the same time, 12 o'clock. And I, you have to be able to kind of space them out a little bit during the day so you can get more people on them. Yeah, we actually had some requests for breakfast. So again, that's something we're going to look into. And it's interesting. So like if, if this had been happening for a while, we would have been looking at data. We would have been doing market research. We would have found, okay, there's less events on Mondays at nine. And that's how we make decisions as a marketer. However, there was no data. <laughs> we all just started doing things at the same time and we're two weeks in and this is what happens. So at this point, again, this is the whole reactive as opposed to proactive, which is not normally my approach, but now we're gonna adjust. So we actually are sending out surveys. Do you want a different time? Do you want, you know, this is something we would do anyway in marketing, getting customer feedback. And so um, as we're, but, and thank you for that feedback, I appreciate it. And that's something that we're gonna be rolling out uh, in the next week or so. Good, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I think, okay. 
And like I said, um, please, you know, be, feel free to email me. I'm happy to do strategy sessions. Actually, I find them that when I do strategy sessions with different companies, it gives me a lot of ideas for our clients. <laughs> so I'm going to be bouncing ideas off of you too, but I'm happy to do it. I'm getting one. Okay, wonderful. So Rachel, I'll be sending you the attendee list. So if you want these, this uh, presentation, uh, she can send them out to you. And again, this will be available on our YouTube channel uh, once it is edited. But again, thank you so much for this. It's really great information. My pleasure. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you. All right, bye-bye. Take care everyone.